All right, so uh, today we're going to talk about uh, some more detail about cardiac MR. Um, the important thing is we're going to be covering a lot of material. This is this gets quite complicated, so it's going to be important for you guys. I will I will have the recording of this available um, after uh, after the conference, um, so that it, it will be important for you guys to study this on your own to spend some time studying it on your own. Um, so. We're going to talk about imaging techniques, specialized imaging planes. This will be later on. And then for this first lecture, we're going to concentrate mostly on the imaging techniques, and then the rest of this we'll get to in our second lecture next week. So starting with the basic imaging techniques, there are two basic types. There's black blood imaging, and the pulse sequence that is used for that is called double inversion recovery fast spin echo. It's a breath hold technique, and it gives you uh, an image like this, where we can see that the uh, blood flow here is black, and it gives you a nice view of the anatomy. Um, as opposed to white blood techniques, where the flowing blood looks white, and the advantage of these white blood techniques is these are these kind of movie type of views that you can see uh, where the heart is moving. So let's look at that again here. So you can see the heart moving in these type of type of views. So that's a white blood technique. And the terms for that, steady state free precession, true fist, fiesta, cine MRI, balance gradient echo, those are all synonymous for this type of technique. And then we'll also talk about phase contrast MRI, which we use to measure blood flow. Now, one of the uh, one of the most important things whenever you're doing cardiac imaging is because we're trying to image a moving structure like the heart, we need to minimize motion. So for breathing motion, we usually use breath holding. We ask the patient to hold their breath for the sequence. So it's important that you can do the imaging sequence within the amount of time that's reasonable for a breath hold. And then for the heart motion itself, we will use cardiac gating to freeze the heart motion. So before you do anything, you have to have good cardiac gating. If you don't have good cardiac gating, you'll have a lot of artifacts on your images and not a very diagnostic study. So it seems pretty straightforward that you place the EKG leads, and the cardiac gating will be based on the R wave. You get good R waves, and then that will be, uh, that will be what the software interprets as, as the heart beats, and will gate to that. And so you would want to place the lead so that your R waves are, are very well defined. So all of this seems nice and simple, but uh, it is not so easy. Because what happens is there's this effect called the magnetohydrodynamic effect, where if you have moving blood, like you have in the aorta and the inferior vena cava that contains ions, when you place that in a magnetic field, that produces voltages that are picked up by the, uh, by the ECG leads. And then that can lead to faulty triggering during systole. So this is what your ECG recording looks like when you're outside the MR, just before you put the, slide the patient into the tunnel everything looks perfect. But then as soon as you slide the patient into the tunnel, you get all of these irregularities in the tracing, and the software has a very hard time trying to figure out which one of these is an R wave, and then that can lead to artifacts when, when you try to reconstruct your images. So what we do now is something that is called vector gating. So it turns out that that magnetohydrodynamic effect uh, has a certain orientation in space, kind of along the y-axis, along the length of the body, because that's, that's the way the aorta runs, as opposed to the changes in voltage that have to do with the heartbeat itself that is oriented differently in space. So the leads are set up differently for vector gating. So you'll have one set of leads set up this way, and then the second set of leads set up that way. And so this then, the, the software can differentiate the changes in the voltage from 
because of the spatial orientation of those changes, the changes in the voltage from the heart, from the conduction system of the heart, as opposed to this magnetohydrodynamic effect. So that is what we use now for cardiac gating. We use vector gating. And so we'll use this to, uh, to identify the, the R waves and to trigger off them. Now, if for any reason that still doesn't work, then as a last resort, you can do peripheral pulse gating. And then here uh, we have uh, this transducer here that's attached to the end of the finger and it picks up the peripheral pulse. But that's a last resort. The problem with this is if you, if you compare the, uh, uh, the ECG gating here, so systole occurs just slightly after this, very slightly after this, and really, but by the time that pulse wave reaches the end of the finger, there's quite a delay. So it can be a long and unpredictable delay between the actual cardiac contraction and the arrival of the pulse that is detected here uh, in, the, in the transducer. So you don't want to do this. You don't want to use this unless you absolutely have to. Okay. So optimally, signals should be spikes like that. But of course, that's not the way it works. So you, what you want are good QRS complexes or good waves that are identified even against any background noise that might be there. And you also have to be careful because you can set a threshold above which this change in voltage will be interpreted uh, as the R wave, and you want to make sure that that threshold is above any background noise or P waves that are there in the background. So here, if that threshold is set too low, then the P waves can be interpreted as the R waves, and then the software will interpret this, this heart rate as twice as fast as what it really is over here. So these are things that you have to be aware of even before you start to scan to make sure that your cardiac gating is adequate so you get diagnostic images. Now these black blood techniques that we use, they suppress signal from the flowing blood, they give us good spatial resolution. These are good for anatomy. The bright blood techniques, the spatial resolution is not quite as good, but the advantage is the temporal resolution, which allows us to put together these movies to actually look at cardiac motion and cardiac function. With these black blood techniques, when we do that, we're looking at one cardiac phase. So we're taking one cardiac phase and kind of freezing the heart motion for that phase, but the information for that is acquired over multiple heartbeats. So we can't acquire, the uh, scanner's not fast enough to acquire all of this in one heartbeat. So because the heart returns to the same position here, we take the information from the same phase of the cardiac cycle in different heartbeats, and then put that together to generate your image. So we still need multiple heartbeats, even though it looks like one frozen image. For this bright blood imaging, where the heart looks like a, where the, the heart's moving here, this looks like it's, it's one single heartbeat, uh, but it really isn't. The information, again, was acquired from multiple heartbeats. But what is done is that the information is acquired, and then it's divided into these different phases of the cardiac cycle between the RR intervals. So the, here, this diagram has it as eight phases in the RR intervals. The standard is about 20. So we'll have 20 still pictures. It will, it will uh, take the data and then generate 20 still pictures between the RR intervals, <clears throat> and then put those pictures together, and you get a movie. And that's how we do bright blood imaging. Now we've talked about, let's get back to uh, our spin echo sequences that we've talked about before. Last week, you give a 90 degree pulse, and then we get this procession here that gives us our signal in the transverse plane. And then we discussed that if we're doing spin echo imaging, because 
of the magnetic field and homogeneity. Things start to go out of phase quickly. We use the 180 degree pulse to reverse that and get things back in phase to generate an echo. And we discussed that this is our basic conventional spin echo pulse sequence. You give a 90 degree pulse, a 180 degree pulse, and then you get an echo. And then in between that, we have a slice selection gradient so that we can put that 90 degree pulse at a particular slice within the body. And we will use that slice select gradient also to place the 180 degree pulse in the imaging slice also. And then we will vary the phase encoding gradient. And in this way, this, this helps us to uh, resolve the, uh, the complex signal uh, spatially to be able to generate an image. But a 90 degree pulse, 180 degree pulse echo, that is your conventional spin echo sequence. Now, what determines the TR if we're doing a spin echo sequence for cardiac gating? Does anybody out there have an answer? So if we're going to give a 90 degree pulse, 180 degree pulse, and get an echo, what's going to determine our TR if we're going to use cardiac gating? So heart rate? Exactly. It's going to be the heart rate. So the TR, the time between the 90 degree pulses, will be gated to the heart rate. And so we will then uh, acquire the information in here in between, and over multiple heartbeats, we will put that information together to be able to generate an image. So for the spin echo pulse sequence, the TR usually equals the heart rate. Now, if we go back to our traditional spin echo sequence, where we give a 90 degree pulse, 180 degree pulse, and we have an echo here, we get our information. And then we do it again, and the only thing we change is the phase encoding gradient to get another echo. If the heart rate is 60 beats per minute, so it's beating one time per second, and we have 256 pixels along the phase encoding axis, how long would the scan take if we did it this way? Anybody have an answer? If you have 20 under 56 pixels along the phase encoding axis, how many times, how many signals do you have to acquire before you have enough information to generate an image? No help from anybody out there? Four minutes? Yeah, why? Because we're changing, <laughs> no, we're changing the phase encoding step each time, right? Each of these gives you one line of case space. The way this sequence is set up, each of these is one line of case space. And if we're only acquiring one line of case space at every heartbeat, and we have 256 pixels in our phase encoding axis, in our, in our phase encoding direction, then this is going to take 256 seconds or over four minutes before we have enough data. So one second times 256, four minutes and 16 seconds. If we try to do it this way, you know, the way we discussed our traditional spin echo sequence, before we have gathered enough data to be, to be able to fill in all the lines of K-space and give us a picture. Well, obviously, that cannot be done in a single breath hold, right? So we have to be able to speed up the imaging process. So what can we do to speed up the imaging process? The problem here is filling up these lines of K-space. That's what slows you down in MR, is getting enough echoes to fill up the, the data matrix here in K-space. So you want to try to make that faster. Since we have to obtain a separate echo for, for each phase encoding step, we have to come up with a way of doing this that speeds up the acquisition. And the way it's done with spin echo imaging is called fast spin echo, also called turbo spin echo. And then this speeds up the sequence enough so that we are able to obtain the image in a single breath hold. So how does this work? Well, we said that 
we need one, we need to change the phase encoding gradient each time to be able to acquire a line of case phase. If we give our 90 degree pulse, 180 degree pulse, apply the phase encoding gradient, we get a signal, right? But what if before we apply the next 90 degree pulse, we apply another 180 degree pulse, and that will give us another signal. And then another 180 degree pulse gives us another signal. Each of these fills in one line of case space. So instead of filling in one line of case space after every single RF pulse, every single 90 degree pulse, we will fill in multiple lines of case space between the 90 degree pulses. And so this enables us to fill up the data matrix faster and speeds up the acquisition. And uh, in this pulse diagram, we've applied the phase encoding gradient. This is a, this is a rewinder to get the phases back back to the beginning before you apply this, and then you apply the next phase encoding gradient, and then you counteract that before you apply the next phase encoding gradient. So the way this diagram is drawn here, instead of acquiring just one line of case space between 90 degree pulses, here we have one, two, three, four that are diagrammed here. So your conventional spin echo pulse sequence, 90 degree pulse, 180 degree pulse, echo, that's one line of case space, 90 degree pulse, 180 degree pulse, echo, right? That's your second line of case space. So this takes a long time because we have to wait for the 90 degree pulses before we can apply the 180 degree pulse. But with fast spin echo, 90 degree pulse, 180 degree pulse signal, 180 degree signal, 180 degree signal, 180 degree signal, before we get to our next 90 degree pulse, and then each time we've gotten these signals, we fill up one line of case space in our data matrix. So the number of 180 degree pulses that you have sequentially in a row between 90 degree pulses, the term for that is the echo train length. That's the number of echoes between the 90 degree pulses. So if your TR is one second, if the, if the patient has a heart rate of 60 beats per second, and your echo train length is 16, meaning that at every heartbeat, instead of acquiring one line of case space, we're acquiring 16 lines of case space. Now your imaging time, if we have to, if we have to have enough data to fill in 256 pixels along the phase encoding axis, is 256 divided by 16, which is 16 seconds. And that is a patient can hold their breath for 16 seconds. So that's how we can speed up the acquisition for a fast spin echo pulse sequence. So notice the echoes here that I have shown you. Uh, my question is a thought question. Why is the yellow signal here strongest? Shouldn't the signals get weaker after the 90 degree pulse? Shouldn't, because remember there's decay, right? Shouldn't the signal get weaker? Why is this the strongest signal? Does anybody have a suggestion? Is it because it's centered? No. No. Is that because after just a couple of 180 degree pulses, all of the signals are aligned the best? That no. Cosmin? Do you have the most transverse magnetization after three Why? versions? Why? Why? Look at the, there, there's a clue. If you look carefully at the, at the pulse sequence itself, the clue is there. Look at the phase encoding gradients. What do you notice? They drop towards what the signal is strongest. The phase encoding gradient is smallest just before the highest signal. Remember, the phase encoding gradient puts things out of phase. The stronger the phase encoding gradient is, the more out of phase things are. The weaker the phase encoding gradient, the less out of phase things are. So the weaker phase encoding gradient, when you apply it, is going to give you more signal than these stronger phase encoding gradients. Now, why, why would we do that? Why is that important? Well, if I ask you, you know, if I show you a conventional spin echo pulse sequence, this one, and I ask you, what's the TE? 
what would you tell me? There's only one right here, right? There's your TR. There's only one TE, unambiguous, right? But here we have multiple echoes between the 90 degree pulse. Which one of those is your TE? And remember that you guys have been reading MR for a couple of years now. For those of you who are second or third year residents, you've looked at fast spin echo sequences on, I guess, on, you know, on your, on your MRs of neuro, if nothing else. But there it's a fast spin echo sequence, but it has a TE. There's a number attached to that TE. Well, where did that number come from if there are multiple echoes here, right? That number came from the strongest echo, which is associated with the smallest phase encoding gradient. So the term for this <clears throat> is the effective TE. So the effective TE is the TE with the lowest phase encoding gradient, and we can manipulate that, right? If I want my effective TE to be very short, then I would put my lowest phase encoding gradient back here. If I wanted my effective TE to be longer, then I would apply my smallest phase encoding gradient further along in the echo train. That's how we manipulate the TE or the effective TE if we're doing fast spin echo. Okay. Now that highest signal, remember when we talk about TE, right, that determines the image contrast. So the highest signal is going to come in the center of K-space where you have the lowest phase encoding gradient. That's in the center of K-space. And that's what determines the image contrast. Okay? So this is how we manipulate the image contrast or the effect of TE when you're doing a fast spin echo sequence. So these double inversion recovery fast spin echo sequences, these are breath hold fast spin echo techniques. We suppress the signal from flowing blood. We get good contrast between the myocardium and the blood pool. And this is the optimal black blood imaging technique. It's a nice short axis view showing you very nice myocardium here is left ventricle. And you can see the blood pool here is nice and black, very nicely suppressed. Now, how do we do that? How do we suppress the blood pool? Well, to talk about that, we need to talk about inversion recovery. So, you know, we start out everything, we put our things in the magnet, we have this longitudinal magnetization. What if we give a 180 degree pulse? After we give that 180 degree pulse, this longitudinal magnetization will recover over time. So that longitudinal relaxation recovers at a rate related to the T1 of the tissues. The shorter the T1 of the tissues, the faster this recovers, okay? Now, what happens, though, if you give a 90-degree pulse right here? At this particular point, remember, we, we talked about what gives you this longitudinal magnetization is the proportion of spins that are pointing in the direction of the magnet, of the main magnetic field versus those that are pointing in the opposite direction of the main magnetic field. Right here, you have the same number of spins pointing in the direction of the field as against the field. So if you give a 90 degree pulse right at this point, there is no longitudinal magnetization to flip into the transverse plane. What does that mean? That means you get no signal from this tissue. So you can suppress the signal from a particular tissue if you apply a 180 degree pulse, and then you wait for this null point, if you happen to know what it is, and then you give the 90 degree pulse right there, you get no signal, you suppress the signal from that tissue because there's no longitudinal component here to flip into the transverse plane. So what if we have two tissues here? So we have one tissue with a short T1, we have another tissue with a longer T1. We give a 180 degree pulse, and we flip everything down here. Now, this recovers the longitudinal magnetization faster because it has a shorter T1. This tissue has a longer T1. This takes a little bit longer time. Right here, when it reaches the null point, we apply a 90-degree pulse. 
This flips into the transverse plane. We get signal from this tissue. We get no signal from this tissue. So we can effectively then suppress the signal from this tissue if we give a 180 degree pulse and then apply our 90 degree pulse at the null point of, the, uh, of this tissue. Now it turns out that blood, green here, has a longer T1 than myocardium, red. So we can suppress the signal from the blood, if we apply a 180 degree pulse, and then we start our imaging sequence, we apply the 90 degree pulse at the null point of the blood. Now this is done in a very clever way using black blood dual inversion. And how does this work? Well, first we take our entire imaging volume, the patients in the magnet, and we apply a 180 degree pulse. And you can see all the spins now, instead of pointing up, are pointing down. But this was over the whole volume that's in the magnet. Now we apply another 180 degree pulse, but it's slice selective. It's only for the imaging slice that we want to look at. So what has this done? It's returned this back to where they were back here, pointing up that slice before we applied the first 180 degree pulse. What happens next? is that the blood outside the imaging slice flows into the imaging slice. And if we wait for just this amount of time, this null point of blood, that's when we give our 90 degree pulse and start our imaging sequence, we will get signal from the stationary tissue within our imaging slice, because there's a longitudinal component there to flip into the transverse plane. We will not get signal from the blood that is now moved into the imaging slice. So this is a black blood dual, that's the principle of black blood dual inversion recovery, and that's how we do black blood imaging with cardiac MR. So this is a breath hold fast spin echo technique. So this allows us to get this image within the breath hold. We can suppress signal from flowing blood inside the cardiac chambers, and it gives us very good contrast between the myocardium in the blood. And here are a series of short axis views using double inversion recovery fast spin echo. So you can see very you get very nice anatomic definition and you get very nice suppression of the blood. Now what else can you do? What are possibilities for speeding up the imaging process? It all comes down to the same thing. You want to reduce the number of phase encoding steps or to try to acquire them faster because that is the rate limiting step whenever you're doing MR. It's all of those phase encoding steps. So we'll talk about these things, rectangular field of view. All of these are synonymous, half Fourier imaging, half next, 0.5 next, parallel imaging, something different. So those are three main methods. Now we kind of talked about rectangular versus square field of view last time, right? So if you have a particular dimension of the body that is shorter than the other dimension, it makes the most sense to make this your phase encoding axis because you have less pixels in this direction. And so the number of phase encoding steps that you have to do is reduced if you applied them along this axis as opposed to applying them over this axis. So that's the advantage of a rectangular versus a square field. Uh, another method is half Fourier imaging, also called half next, 0.5 next, half scan. This takes advantage of the actual symmetry of K space itself. So this is the data matrix. It's a picture of what that data matrix looks like. Notice that the left half here is symmetric to the right half. The top half is symmetric to the bottom half. So if you've acquired a little bit more than half of this data matrix, you can fill in, or the computer software can estimate and fill in what the rest of it is based on this property of symmetry. And so this also allows you then to obtain enough information to generate an image without having to acquire every single one of those phase encoding steps. 
So usually this requires acquiring about 65% of the phase encoding steps. And once you've done that, the software applies this process of symmetry for this case-based data matrix and then fills in what the rest of it is supposed to look like. And then you have enough data to generate an image. The downside of this is that it does reduce the signal to noise uh, because you know you haven't acquired you haven't acquired all of the lines of case space. I mean you, you you've kind of undersampled the data, so it does reduce the signal to noise, but it does speed up the acquisition. Now let me let me ask you this question, another slightly advanced question: Which axis here is the phase encoding axis? Is this the phase encoding axis, the vertical axis, or is this the phase encoding axis, the horizontal axis? Which is the phase encoding axis? Horizontal. Why? There's ghosting artifact. It's not, yeah, it, it's, it's not ghosting artifact. The term, there is artifact. The term for this is what? What's oh, the term? Wrap. It's wrap. Yeah, phase wrap. There's this phase wrap artifact here, which only occurs along the phase encoding axis, okay? So it's called phase wrap artifact, and this occurs when the object is larger than the field of view along the phase encoding axis. So what I've done here in this image, I just cut off that part of the picture and moved it to the other side, to show you how it really fits in nicely. It's really this part of the image, okay? This is really this part of the image that has been mismapped to the wrong side. And now I just cut it out, you know, with Photoshop and moved it over here to show you what it's supposed to look like. So this occurs from undersampling along the phase encoding axis. And, and so why, why does this occur? It occurs when the object is larger than the field of view along the phase encoding axis. Now, what, what happens here is we talked about the phase encoding gradient along the phase encoding axis. It, it puts these things. So here, if the phase encoding axis is going this way, going transverse across the image, all of these rows, by applying the phase encoding gradient, they're put slightly out of phase with each other. And you can see how what that looks like here. And then when the data is acquired, uh, the, the software uses that to be able to place the signals into the three-dimensional regions of space to give you your picture. But it assumes that everything came from the field of view. So you designate how many centimeters is your field of view before you do the scan. Then you do the scan. All of the data is acquired, and then the software reconstructs the image. But the assumption is that all of the echoes, all of the information came from within the field of view. If there's a part of the anatomy that is outside the field of view, by applying the phase encoding gradients, this is also affected by the phase encoding gradient here. And what, what is out here is minus 90 degrees, gets mapped back into the field of view as 270 degrees on this side. And this part of the anatomy that is also outside the field of view out here at 450 degrees will get, will get mismapped back over here at 90 degrees. So this will move to this side. So the software maps the signal that came from outside of the field of view back into the field of view. And that's what gives you that phase wraparound artifact. It usually doesn't occur along the frequency encoding axis because uh, we oversample and we, we take account for that along the, along the frequency encoding axis. Remember, the phase encoding axis costs you time. So if you wanted to acquire this data accurately, it would, it would require more phase encoding steps and changing the field of view also. So, Another method to try to speed up the acquisition by acquiring fewer lines of case space is called parallel imaging. And what is done here is in, instead of acquiring each single line of case space, it skips alternate lines. 
So then you don't have to acquire every line of case space. You can acquire just half the lines and it speeds up your acquisition. Well, the problem with that is if you just took the data and then reconstructed an image, it gives you, because of all the undersampling, it gives you this terrible uh, wraparound artifact where when the image is supposed to look like this, it looks like this. Because essentially the software interprets that as a reduced field of view. So how, how can we fix that? So if you acquire every other line of case space, your images actually would come out like this. But what we would like to do is to cut out these pieces and move them back to where they belong. This is called the unfolding problem in parallel imaging to take these images and then convert them to this kind of image that you know, we all want to look at. So how this is done is that there are these multiple coils. And what happens is, is that when the information is acquired, when these echoes are acquired, uh, because these echoes are acquired in these, if we take this particular one, in these two coils simultaneously, uh, because in anatomic space, this region of the anatomy is closer to this coil, the echo here is actually going to be stronger than it is in this coil. And the software can use that information to give you some anatomic uh, location to be able to say that, okay, this echo came from this region of space, this side of the anatomy, because it was stronger in this coil than it was in this coil. So that's taking advantage of coil sensitivity and converting that into localizing information by comparing the strength of the echoes simultaneously obtained within both coils. So then what happens is, is that instead of something that looks like this, when we have this stuff over here, by comparing the strength of the signal between both coils, the software can decide, okay, this was stronger on in this coil than it was over here, so it will move this, it will move the, the correct pixels on this side to the other side, and it will move the correct pixels over here to this side, using the same principle. So this allows you to unfold the image. Uh, the disadvantage, again, whenever you reduce the number of phase encoding steps, you pay a penalty in terms of signal to noise. So that reduces your signal to noise by about 40%. And because you already have this terrible problem with the phase wrap artifact, your field of view must be larger than the object scanned. So you have to be very careful about that. If your field of view is too small, then you cannot salvage the image. So typically this reduces by a factor of two the imaging time uh, using this principle. Okay. And so in GE, this is called asset. So if you see the technology say, okay, we've turned the asset on, they're, they're using this to try to speed up the acquisition. Okay, so let's now move on to our radiant echo or bright blood imaging. So when we do these bright blood imaging and get these cinematic sequences, this gives us very good spatial resolution. I mean, very good temporal resolution, but the spatial resolution is not as good. This is good for functional analysis uh, because we're going to use this to be able to, count, to look at wall motion, and also to calculate stroke volumes and cardiac outputs. It demonstrates the blood flow as bright. That's why we call it bright blood imaging. And the other advantage of this is where you have turbulent flow, here this patient has aortic stenosis and regurg, you get these low signal jets where you have turbulent flow. And we can demonstrate that also within the images. So these are all synonymous, uh, Cine Flash, TrueFist, Fiesta, to give us, giving us these cinematic displays. And even though this looks like one heartbeat, again, the information was acquired over multiple heartbeats. So what we have here is a series of still images 
that was acquired over different phases of the cardiac cycle. And then those images are strung together in a cinematic fashion here to give you that movie. Now, this is done with retrospective cardiac gating, meaning that the data is acquired continuously at the same time as the ECG tracing here is acquired. And so the data is this, uh, the cardiac cycle is separated into phases and the data is binned into these different phases. And then an image is reconstructed for each one of these phases, a still image, and then those images are put together to give you a movie. So even though it looks like one heartbeat, the information came from multiple heartbeats that was struck together. Now, this does require rapid imaging, so this is done with gradient echo imaging, so it's not spin echo. Uh, it's a partial flip angle imaging. It's not a 90 degree flip angle. There is no 180 degree refocusing pulse. There's a dephasing and a rephasing pulse uh, along the read axis here. So this is done with gradient echo imaging to generate the echoes that are used to obtain the information to fill the lines of case space. Now, for each, for each image, uh, each image represents a separate phase of the cardiac cycle. So to be able to acquire enough data to be able to generate an image, we have to fill all enough lines of case space so that we have enough data to get this image and this image and this image and so on. So there are multiple lines of case space. Uh, this is done in a fashion called a segmented case space acquisition, where we have multiple lines of case space that are obtained for each phase of the cardiac cycle during each heartbeat. So what does that mean? The, the TRs in this sequence are very, very short, on the order of three milliseconds. So uh, we'll have a, a TR and a signal, a TR and a signal, a TR and a signal, and it, and it goes on continuously. And then we will take multiple signals here to put together for this phase, and then we will go on to the next phase and the next phase. The number of lines of case space obtained at each phase of the cardiac cycle during each heartbeat, those are called the views per segment. So if we've acquired four lines of case space during each phase of the cardiac cycle uh, to, to generate this, an image for this phase of the cardiac cycle, then that's four views per segment. If, you've, if you're doing eight lines of case space for each one of these, then you have eight views per segment. And we'll talk about why that's important. So we're going to obtain multiple lines of case space for each phase of the cardiac cycle at each heartbeat. And this is important because this determines the temporal resolution of each frame. Remember, each one of these images, right, is a still image. The question is, how much time does this image really represent? What is the temporal resolution of this image? And it turns out that the, the formula for that is just the TR times the views per segment, right? So if we do this calculation, it might make this a little easier for you to understand. In this diagram, we've put eight phases of the cardiac cycle here, but real, realistically, we do 20. So pretend there are 20 frames in this series. And if we're using 12 views per segment, we're going to acquire 12 lines of case space for this frame, 12 lines for the next one, 12 lines for the next one, et cetera. So the TR is very short. It's about 3.9 milliseconds. So to acquire those 12 lines of case space for this frame, it's the TR times the number of views per segment, 3.9 times 12. So it's almost 50 milliseconds. So then each one of these still images, before we string it together to get a movie, 
will represent 50 milliseconds in time. Now, since we are requiring 12 lines of K-space during each heartbeat, and we have to fill up 192 lines of K-space before we have enough data to generate an image, 192 divided by 12 means that after 16 heartbeats, we have enough data to generate an image. So if the heart rate is 60 beats per second, then in 16 seconds, after a 16 second breath hold, we will have enough data to, to generate our image or our, our sequence here, and then get this moving frames or, or this movie at this one particular slice location. Now, why is this important? Because as the heart rate increases, right, the images can get blurrier and blurrier if you don't improve your temporal resolution. So how do you improve your temporal resolution? You decrease views per segment. So as the heart rate gets faster and faster, you have to decrease the views per segment, the lines of K-space you're trying to fill up at every phase of the cardiac cycle to improve your temporal resolution. Now it turns out, so if this patient, instead of a heart rate of 60, had a heart rate of 120, I could reduce my views per segment to six. I would improve the temporal resolution, um, but instead of uh, 16 heartbeats, it would take 32 heartbeats, but 32 heartbeats for somebody whose heart is beating 120 beats per second is the same amount of time as 16 heartbeats at 16 seconds for somebody whose heart is beating at 60 beats per second. So there isn't, so it doesn't really, even though you're decreasing the number of views per segment because the heart rate has gotten faster, it hasn't really prolonged your imaging time or made it difficult for the patient to hold to hold their breath long enough that long okay so these terms are all synonymous with bright blood cine ssfp steady state free procession fist fast imaging with steady state procession also called fiesta g causes fiesta fast imaging with steady state acquisition and these use fully refocused gradients. I'll talk about what that means, but these refocused gradients allows you to preserve more signal than with conventional gradient echo sequences that are used in body imaging as opposed to cardiac imaging. When we use these steady state pre-procession sequences, the contrast depends on the T2 to T1 ratio of the tissue. That determines how bright things will look these sequences. And it gives us very good contrast between the blood pool and the myocardium. So with these balanced radiant echo sequences or these steady state pre-procession sequences, the reason they're called balanced is that at the very end, all of the gradients that have been applied are reversed. And that minimizes the amount of dephasing that has occurred from the application of your gradients so that there is more signal available for the next excitation pulse. So that, that makes then, that, that, that makes the tissues actually brighter and increases the signal to noise. So if you compare uh, gradient echo sequences that you use in body imaging compared to these balanced gradient echo sequences that we use for cardiac imaging, notice that there's higher signal to noise here. Also notice that the, flu the fluid here, the pericardial effusion in this example is brighter. The blood pool itself is also brighter, okay? So fluid is brighter in these sequences, in these balanced gradient echo sequences. The blood pool is brighter and we have more signal to noise uh, when we're using these for cardiac imaging as opposed to the gradient echo sequences that are used for body imaging. And so when, when we compare the gradient echo sequences that are used for cardiac imaging, these have very short TR, very short TE, the flip angle is different, 
compared to body imaging, longer TR, longer T, notice that higher signal to noise, fluid is bright. Fast gradients, better contrast, and the fluid is bright, so pericardial fusion will be bright on these cardiac uh, imaging, uh, in this software that we use for cardiac imaging. Okay, so now the next thing we're going to talk about is phase contrast imaging. Now, so far, what we've talked about or what you're used to looking at when you're looking at an MR image is a magnitude image. How bright are the pixels? And, and that is just related to how much signal uh, is how much signal uh, is uh, is produced by that particular region of space. So what you're looking at here then is the magnitude of this vector or every single voxel that is going across, every single pixel that is going across. So here, if you look at the aorta, right, if we take three successive pixels, voxels, as we, as we go across here, it's very bright because the magnitude of this vector is the same, so it looks very much the same. If you look out here in the lung, the magnitude of that vector would be very small, and so that appears as dark in these magnitude images. But it turns out that there is also a phase associated with these vectors. Um, so far, when, we, when we've looked at the images, we haven't taken into account the phase, although the magnitude in both the phase is calculated by the software on all of these imaging sequences. So in addition to magnitude, each voxel also has a phase component, and the software will calculate that. Well, how, how does the magnet determine or how, how we determine what the phase component is when, it's, when the vectors are precessing around in the transverse plane? If you have two coils here at 90 degree angles to each other, as this vector is precessing around, not only can you determine the magnitude of the vector, but you can also determine the phase of the vector when you combine the signal that is obtained from both coils. It turns out that that signal will be out of phase by 90 degrees, but by combining the signal from both of these coils, you can determine both the magnitude and the phase of these vectors for each voxel. And that is also calculated, although we don't use the phase information when we're just looking at these anatomic images, at these magnitude images. Here we're only interested in, you know, how bright is the signal? How large? What's the magnitude of the vector? Not the, not the phase of the vector. Now, when does phase become important? Well, for phase contrast imaging, as protons move through a gradient, so here we have a patient lying down in the magnet, we apply a gradient here, so the magnetic field here at the head is stronger than the magnetic field here towards the legs. So the stationary protons up here around the head are precessing faster than the protons down here at the leg, right? So they are moving faster, so you'll see that they're kind of out of phase with these protons down here. Although within the imaging slice, within that particular imaging slice, if you're dealing with stationary tissue, all of that tissue in the imaging slice will be at the same phase, okay? because it's experiencing the same magnetic field strength here. If we have something that is moving through the gradient, we have protons that are moving in a blood vessel here, towards our imaging slice, they experience, they have a different history of gradients that they have experienced relative to the stationary tissue. So when it arrives in our imaging slice, this will be phase shifted compared to the stationary tissue. So it has a phase memory. And we can take advantage of that. It, turns out that that phase shift will be related to the velocity, how fast this is moving within the gradient. So if we don't apply a gradient, you have stationary tissue as we're 
you know, going from the feet to the head. And you can have tissue that is moving within a blood vessel or protons moving within a blood vessel. They're all going to be at the same phase, right? Because they're all experiencing the same magnetic field. Now, if we apply a gradient, okay, up here, the magnetic field is stronger. So the stationary tissue here is going to be precessing faster than the stationary tissue down here at the foot. But something that is moving protons that are moving within the blood, as they're moving up towards this imaging slice, they will be at a different phase by the time they arrive at this imaging slice than the stationary tissue. And we can calculate that phase difference, and that will give us an idea of what the velocity is for the blood, for the protons that are in the moving blood. And this is done in a very clever way using bipolar gradients. So what does this mean? It means we're going we're to apply a gradient that increases here in this example from the head to the foot. So I've just put in some arbitrary numbers. So here we apply this gradient so it goes up towards the head. At the foot it's 1.4, in the middle it's 1.5, towards the head it's 1.6. And then we reverse it so that now at the foot it's 1.6, in the middle it's 1.5, and at the top it's 1.4. Well, what does this do to the stationary tissues? If we look at the stationary tissues, right, the average gradient that they have experienced after application of this bipolar gradient is the same throughout the anatomy. 1.4 plus 1.6 here at the foot, 3 divided by 2 is 1.5. So everywhere here, the average gradient that the stationary tissue has experienced is 1.5. So there is no phase shift. You see that they're all in the same phase. So we're looking at the transverse component here. But blood that is moving within the imaging slice has not experienced the same gradients as the stationary tissue. So when that blood arrives in our imaging slice, it will be out of phase now relative to the stationary tissue. We can measure that, and that gives us an idea of how fast this was moving. So the stationary spins, no net phase shift, the moving spins acquire a phase shift relative to the stationary spins, and it turns out that's going to be proportional to their velocity. So this is where we get this terminology, velocity encoded phase contrast MRI. We have encoded the velocity of the moving protons by the phase shift. Now, this animation here nicely demonstrates it. So first, let's just look at the stationary spin. So you look at that stationary spin, we apply one gradient, then we apply the reverse gradient. You see that it goes back to where it started, right? So there is no net phase shift in the stationary spin. It goes back to where it started. And the same thing will be for the stationary spin up here within your imaging slice. But what happens to the blood that is moving? It moves up. And then when you apply the reverse gradient, because it's in the stronger part of that gradient, it is phase shifted quite a bit. And there's now a pretty big difference between the moving blood, the phase of the moving blood, and the phase of the stationary, of the, of the stationary tissue. Okay. So it turns out it's a little bit more complicated than that. The bipolar gradients are actually applied twice. It's reversed the second time. And that increases the imaging time. So when we're doing phase contrast, we have to acquire it twice. So that doubles the imaging time for this. The images are subtracted and the phase shifts are depicted as plus 180 to minus 180. So uh, what does this mean, right? Here the blood is moving up. And here you see the phase shift is about uh, 170 degrees, right? So that tells us the blood was moving that way. Had the blood been coming down the other direction, the phase shift would have been minus 170 degrees. So the phase shift will not only give you an idea of the velocity, but also gives you an idea of which way the blood is moving. Okay. Now, 
let me ask you this question. What happens, what, what would you do if the phase shift is greater than 180 degrees, right? Because it's the phase shift, it's that degree of phase shift that tells us what direction the blood is moving. So here's your thought question. If this shifted all the way over to here, greater than 180 degrees, how, what would you do to this bipolar gradient to be able to get that phase shift less than 180 degrees so that you can determine the direction the blood flow is moving? You understand the question? Do we understand the question? Instead of making it bipolar? No, so the, so the problem is, is that we've said we want our phase shift to be less than 180 degrees because that, that will tell us the direction the blood is flowing. Mm -hmm. Here the phase shift was 170 degrees, so that told us the blood was flowing upwards. If this phase shift was negative 170 degrees, that would tell us the blood flow was coming down in the opposite direction, right? But what if, because this blood is moving so quickly, this phase shift comes out way over here? right? Higher than 180 degrees, then we wouldn't be able to tell which way the blood was flowing. So if that is occurring, what would you have to do to the bipolar gradient to get that phase shift less than 180 degrees? Decrease it? Yes. You would need to decrease the bipolar gradient. So you can see here that the strength of this bipolar gradient has to somehow be related to the velocity of this blood flow in order for you to get accurate information about the velocity and the direction of the blood. Okay? So, magnitude images you're all familiar with, this is what a phase image looks like. Now, remember I said the data was subtracted so that wherever you have stationary tissue, there's nothing. It's all gone. It all disappears. Okay? The only signal that's depicted here is signal from moving blood, from moving tissue. Stationary protons, no color. Moving protons will be encoded as black or white. The color depicts the flow direction. So here, the aorta, the flow, ascending aorta flow is going up. So flow going upwards is depicted as black. Flow going downwards in the descending aorta is depicted as white. And the brightness or darkness is related to the flow velocity. So notice in the SVC, the flow is going down, same direction as the aorta. So it is white, but it is not as white as the aorta because the flow velocity is less than the flow velocity in the aorta. This is exactly analogous to color Doppler ultrasound. This is the equivalent, the MR equivalent of color Doppler ultrasound this 2D phase contrast MRI. So now we, we can do this, we break it up into phases, just like we do when we do the, the, you know, the moving pictures of the heart to get flow information for the vessels that we are looking at here. So we can, we can measure the cross-sectional area of the vessel. We can measure the average velocity of flow within that cross-sectional area, and that gives us the flow rate. So we can calculate the flow rates of these vessels. We calculate the average velocity in here. We calculate the area, multiply those two, you get the flow rate. Now, there's something called the velocity encoding gradient. Remember we were talking about that bipolar gradient? That has to be set properly in advance to avoid aliasing. So here where the velocity encoding gradient was set at 100 centimeters per second, notice that pixels are showing up white here when they should be black. That's because we said, remember, if the phase goes beyond 180 degrees, it is mismapped, okay? This is called aliasing. So what we need to do is we need to set our flow encoding gradient or velocity encoding gradient proper, proper to the actual flow velocity. So we, we set it so that it is increased to be able to depict flow at 120 centimeters per second. And now all of that aliasing goes away. So before you do the sequence, you decide what your velocity encoding gradient should be. 
and it should be slightly higher than the peak velocity that you think the, is within the vessel that you are looking at, okay? This is analogous to the pulse repetition frequency in color Doppler when we're applying this. Now you might ask, well, why don't we just use a very high velocity encoded rate? Why don't, why don't we just use 500 centimeters per second for everything, right? The problem with that is the error. So the error in your flow measurements is a percentage of your velocity encoding gradient. So if it's 5% of 100 centimeters per second, your error is 5 centimeters per second. If it's 5% 5 of 500 centimeters per second, it's 25 centimeters per second. So that contributes to error. So you want your velocity encoding gradient close to and sl but slightly above the peak velocity of the vessel you are interrogating. So here where we're looking at the pulmonary artery, right? notice by the way it's changing in color, meaning the flow is changing. It's going up and down, there's pulmonary regurg. But when you look right in the center, and that's where you will tend to see aliasing, because the center of the vessel is where you have the highest velocity of flow, notice that the center is different in color than the rest of it. That's what aliasing looks like. And you have to be there at the magnet when you do this. And when you see that, you realize that my velocity encoding gradient is too low. I have to increase it. So I reacquire the acquisition after increasing the velocity encoding gradient here. And all of that aliasing goes away. Okay. And now we talked about flow direction, right? Notice that it's changing in color. It's changing from black to white, meaning the flow is going up but then it's going down. So this patient has pulmonary regurgitation. The flow is going forward in the pulmonary artery, and then it's going backwards. That's why the flow is changing color, okay? And we can measure that. We can measure the amount of forward flow. We can measure the amount of reverse flow. Same thing with the aorta. Notice here it's changing color. It's going forward and it's going backward. We can measure the forward flow. We can measure the reverse flow. We can quantify the amount of regurgitation with phase contrast imaging. And that's not where it stops. Now, so far we've looked at two-dimensional phase contrast where we are looking at one transverse plane and we're looking at flow through plane going through our imaging slice. But what if we sensitize the flow to all three dimensions? to all three directions, the X, Y, and Z axis, three-dimensionally over the entire volume that we want to look at. That gives us 4D flow MRI, and that looks like this, where you have a volumetric acquisition here, and you are now able to look at flow not just in one direction, but in all three directions. And then you acquire all of this data and then you can go back and take any particular region of the vessel and you can interrogate it to determine what the peak flow is, how much flow is going forward within that area, how much flow is going in reverse. The downside is that it takes about 10 minutes or 15 minutes to acquire all of this data. So patient has to breathe very quietly or we need to use some kind of respiratory triggering, which we'll talk about, or respiratory gating, which we'll talk about later. Here's an example of somebody with a little bit of aortic coarctation, and you can see that the speed is encoded in colors here. So there's a little bit, you see that high velocity flow right there where the coarctation is, where it's encoded in red, right? So this is 4D flow MRI, where now we've encoded the flow not just in one direction, but in all three directions. Okay. All right. So we'll stop there for today. Does anybody have any questions?